So in these next two lectures, we're going to be looking at power quality issues that would be occurring in the cycle to second time frame. We've already talked a little bit about power quality when we got into the reliability calculations earlier this year. Um, but we're going to be looking at a couple different cases. We're going to be looking at voltage sags due to the faults in this lecture. And then in the next lecture, we'll be looking at voltage sags due to motor startup as well as harmonics. So as far as the range that we're going to be covering here, I'm going to do a little bit of a, an overview on the measurements that you would need to take for this and then go through a few power quality definitions. And then I want to get into what's really the impact of voltage sag on loads. And again, these are events in terms of cycles to seconds. Then we'll go through some calculation steps. So I'll, I'll kind of outline the, the methodology that we're going to take for doing kind of simplistic calculations. Then I'll work through a couple examples. And then one of those examples will be um, involving windmill. And the next lecture, I'll get into the motor startup and the, and the harmonics. And so for this lecture in part A, we'll do the overview first. We'll get into the modeling framework in part B, and then get into the sample calculations in part C. So probably your experience with measurements up to this point have maybe been kind of like using a handheld calculator and a oscilloscope. And if you're using a, a handheld um, um, meter, uh, I think I said calculator, but I meant to see like a, like a handheld um, meter. Basically what you're doing is you're taking measurements in say like the second time frame. Utility SCADA systems, when they're monitoring top of feeder voltages and currents, or we're, we're, we're pulling off recloser values. So those are typically in a two second time interval. But if you really want to see what's going on sub second, then you typically need to have some higher end measurements. And so this is an example of a high end measurement system by a company called Dranitz. And you could buy this equipment. A lot of times you may just need it temporarily so you can actually rent this equipment. And this particular type of system is met to um, capture these high speed harmonics. And so if you look at the specifications that are on the right hand side of the screen, you basically have a couple different time frames for harmonics. So if you're looking at like load speed sampling, this would be on a 32 microsecond per point. This is the time difference between the points you capture. Then if you're doing high speed transits, you can, you can capture down to one microsecond between points. And this is what you would need for capturing events, say like, like lightning strikes. So these are designed to be compliant to the various IEEE standards. Uh, 519 is the harmonic standard that 1547 links in with. You can trigger on deviations in the wave shape. So if for some reason the, the cycle has a discrepancy compared to the previous cycle, that'll cause a triggering. You can actually do what they call pre and post triggers, um, have pre and post trigger buffers. And so basically the idea would be is if the event occurs, you wanna see what was going on before the event. So that's sometimes referred to as the, the pre-trigger um, portion of the waveform. You can look at harmonics that are integer multiples of the fundamental 50 or 60 Hertz. And then this, these types of devices can also do flicker calculations we talked about before. So these values of PST and PLT that are associated with flicker and DER devices can also be characterized by these types of meters. And to capture all this waveform in the field, you, you typically don't wanna have rotating media in here that tend to fail. Usually these have a lot of memory, internal um, core memory. So in this case, this particular device has four gigabytes. So it could store a lot of these high-speed waveforms. And this would show one of the types of waveforms you could actually see on a, say like a utility circuit. So what this particular event is, this is showing a capacitor switching event. Normally when we talked about capacitors before, we're doing the analysis in terms of phaser analysis. And what you guys saw would be if you switch a capacitor in, you would get a, increase in voltage, then you kind of guess if you switch the capacitor out, it would decrease back again. And so you could see this by doing these 
problems with K factors or doing this in windmill or open DSS. But what also happens if you have a capacitor switching on is that capacitance interacts with the inductance in the circuit. And given they have some resistance in there means you have an RLC series circuit, which is gonna give you a high speed transit. And so in steady state, yeah, you'll get the phasor current increase or, or change, I should say. But then there's also a transit portion, which is shown in here as well. And so what we see in this particular case, when the switching event occurs, that this voltage all of a sudden jumps up to a really high value, um, maybe a couple times larger than the nominal voltage. And then it oscillates and eventually it dies out within about a cycle or so. Is this an issue? Well, it, it kind of depends. And so what this is showing is what you would see on the 480 volt side of a industrial customer distribution transformer. And if you had some loads that were sensitive to this sort of a glitch or spike, this could maybe cause some problems. This is one of the reasons why utilities are kind of careful about switching capacitors on and off because they know that when a capacitor switches that it's gonna create this type of event. And this sort of event could trigger some type of a load response that's, that's not you know, what the customer wants. And so anyway, just be aware this is happening within, within an electrical cycle, 1 60th of a second. And you're not gonna see this sort of thing if you just do conventional two second SCADA metering. You have to have these higher end types of measurement systems in order to capture this information. Now, other sort of events you're gonna see is you're gonna see faults a lot of times in these circuits. This shows some measurements taken at the top of the feeder. And this is showing, for example, a single line to ground fault. And you'll notice that you're gonna have a phase A current jump up to a very high value during the course of the fault. Another sort of value you see plotted on here is a neutral current. So the neutral current jumps up as well. And you'll also notice on here, there's a little bit of a DC offset. This is another aspect of the transit. Um, so anyway, this is what you'd see for a single line to ground fault. If you have a line to line fault where the currents are flowing in a loop, this shows a, a line to line type of event. And then this example three, what this shows is this shows a three phase fault. And you'll see at the very beginning, it probably doesn't start out at three phase. It probably starts out as one or two phases, but then after a while it turns into a three phase fault. Um, so anyway, this is what you would actually see if you had these high speed devices. We haven't done these sort of calculations before in class because we always did phaser analysis. And we did calculate, you know, what would be the magnitude of these currents in steady state, but then we had no ability of calculating, you know, what this initial response to the fault was, because that would take a what we refer to as a transit analysis. So Another thing that you would be concerned about if you're like a distribution planner is what are my industrial and commercial customers seeing as a result of these faults? As you know, we're going to get faults on distribution circuits, and it's kind of hard to prevent, prevent those you know, occurring. There's no perfect way of eliminating that completely. And what you're going to see, and this we'll talk about how we can calculate this in just a little bit, is when the fault occurs, it pulls a, a large amount of current. And that's going to give you a lot of drop across the substation impedance, is going to give you a lot of drop across the line impedance. And what that's going to do is that's going to cause a drop in voltage. And this is what we refer to as voltage sag. This shows an actual recorded waveform. This would be for a 480 volt customer. And what we're seeing is that before the fault would occur, that we're at some sort of a nominal value of voltage. And then once that fault starts drawing a lot of current, then that's gonna cause a collapse of the voltage. Since this is a single line of ground fault, it just causes a collapse on one phase, but we see it kind of dropping from this value for one of the phases down to the small value. And so this is gonna be seen by all the customer loads. It's gonna be seen by the motors and the power electronic devices, et cetera.
And what we'd be worried about is to what extent would this voltage sag cause a disruption in customer load? Now, it's not causing an outright outage. It's not causing a safety or a safety event, but it can have the same impact as, as, as far as causing a load at the customer side, maybe to trip or possibly even damaging the device. All right. So this is kind of what we're concerned about in these next two lectures is how to calculate these SAGs, these SAGs in voltage, and what kind of impact could this have on customer devices? So can a relay see this? If we have a relay at the top of the feeder, can a relay see this? Well, relays have waveform recording capability. It's utility um, personnel would call these oscillographs, oscillographics. And so this particular Schweitzer device is 451. Um, you have the ability of using the memories you see fit. So you can get 24 seconds at one kilohertz. So that would probably be enough to see the SAG event in detail. You can even sample higher at eight kilohertz. Um, and, but you can only record this for three seconds. I'm wondering what the value this would be because this has a front end filter on it that's at three kilohertz. I'm, I'm not sure what this would mean. Uh, and then the other thing too, they have what they call these event records. And so what event record does is that you have an internal calculation in these relays that takes place every quarter of an electrical cycle. And when this gets triggered, it'll put this information into what's called an event record, it's like a text file. And then you could ping that later. And so anyway, you can actually have this event file updated every quarter of a cycle or every cycle. So you can actually capture this. And these relays, if they're connected up to the network, you could even have these set up to send a text message. And so if you know this relay is attached to this critical customer, when this relay sees this fault, you can actually have, you can actually set this up where you would have a text message sent out to like the utility customer service representative and they would know to, you know, they probably gonna be expecting a call from one of their big customers because they, they've seen a, an outage or they've seen a glitch in their service. Industrial customers will nowadays typically have some type of power quality monitoring on their side of the meter. So they need something that's not utility owned that they can use for tracking this. This is an example of a Schneider PowerLogic box. Um, this is set up for industrial customers. So it's set up for up to 600 volts. You can trigger on a cycle by cycle basis. Um, you have an a, event capturing of a, of a half a cycle. You could sample at really high frequencies for oscillographics and this can also compute flicker. So the industrial customer of a large facility will want something like this because if they see a piece of equipment that goes offline, first thing they'll do is to see if this was caused by utility glitch. And then once the industrial customer has this information, they can call the utility and see if there's something that could be done about this sort of, a, sort of thing happening again. And then utilities are even putting in higher end devices that are not relays. And this is a very popular device, this SCL 735, which utilities are putting at the top of feeders. And this gives them higher speed sampling than the relays could provide. And so this has the flicker, ca flicker calculations. It has the memory. You can capture waveforms. You can, you can capture these events. And these are installed nowadays on a lot of feeders that have large amounts of DER like PV systems. And so if it turns out that this PV is causing some issues with flicker, then they, they could be captured by these meters. And so this is something we're seeing as well as you, you know, utilities are proactively putting out um, higher speed measurements out in these circuits as well. So as far as power quality, we'll kind of talk about what power quality is from more of a utility standpoint. But qu power quality means a lot of different things depending on the person um, wh whom they're working for. So if you have an industrial customer, you know, they're worried about the impact of utility supply on their productivity. How is this gonna impact their plant operations? Is it gonna cause something in, to fail 
an assembly line or some sort of process line. You'll have impact on commercial customers and they're probably more worried about can they keep their store open? Is it going to cause like a cash register to malfunction? Is it going to cause an issue with their heating and cooling? Is it going to cause an issue with their computers? If you think about like a grocery store, they don't want to have the refrigeration units trip offline. The companies that make the equipment, the equipment manufacturers, well, they have to build equipment that can have a certain tolerance to these utility events. And so if specifications have been developed as far as different sort of ride through capability, they need to make sure their equipment can adhere to that. And then if you're a utility distribution engineer, then you'd be concerned about providing high reliability service. And it's not just SADI and SAFI, it gets more into a little bit MAFI in a way, and that for some of these customers, and if you have a disruption of service in the order of the cycles, it could just have the same effect as a longer term outage in terms of minutes, because again, it could, it could knock a critical process offline. Government regulators get involved in this because they handle complaints from customers. And so if, if, if you're um, a large customer and you complain to your utility about issues, if utility doesn't seem to resolve those, you can actually complain directly to the Public Utility Commission. If the Public Utility Commission gets enough of these complaints, then they'll force the utility to, to do something about it. So as far as definition of power quality, it's really any sort of deviation from a constant amplitude, constant frequency voltage waveform. So what the customer expects to see, and I'm just gonna draw this for single phase, is a nice clean sine wave, right? Should have a constant amplitude, should have a constant frequency. There should be no instantaneous jumps in the phase angle. But what we'll see later on, there are things that are gonna occur that can cause this voltage to sag, that could cause deviations very um, ringing deviations in the voltage. And so anytime we have any sort of deviation from this pure 50 or 60 Hertz waveform, then that would be a power quality issue. Whether this is gonna have an impact is gonna depend on the nature of customer load. Now, most households, most residential customers don't have very sophisticated load types. They have lights and electronics and they have refrigerator load and washer dryer load and they have air conditioning heating load but but these types of loads aren't really that sensitive to these deep, you know very fast deviations in voltage however if you get into these large customer loads let's say if it involves like a power electronic converter that's driving a large motor or some other sort of critical industrial process is very dependent on, say it's looking at the zero crossings of the, of the voltage waveform, um, then yeah, it can make a huge difference. And so usually we're not gonna be concerned about power quality impact like this on residential customers. It's really more the impact on the, the, larger, the larger users of electricity. As far as the power quality categories, like say we, kind of talked about this already at the core would be what's your percent availability? The number of nines, right? Is it 99.99 or 99.9999? You know, what percent of the time you have service? So that's kind of the core of power quality. And then outside of that, you'd have what we call power system reliability, which is basically outage minutes or outage hours per year frequency of interruption per year, things like that. We, we went through some calculations of this. But now when we get into voltage deviations, then we get into sags, we get into swells. Um, there could be harmonics that we're gonna see. There could be deviations in frequency. There could be periodic changes in the voltage magnitude, which are, uh, which are occurring all the time, which we call flicker. There could be different transits like the over, voltage due to the capacitor switching we talked about. 
So this is kind of what we're going to get into. This is what we're going to get into next are these types of events. We'll do some simple calculations for this. Um, but in order to properly characterize this, you, you, you would need a different type of a computer program for, for solving transits, actually. So again, we want to make sure that we don't have in our waveform these these surges and sags or even these even these spikes you know spikes could cause issues as well because it will, we'll get into some of the issues in just a little bit but number one they could they could damage equipment okay they can maybe cause some insulation to fail or cause some piece of electronics to, to break down um, also they can result in erratic operation of a process line um, poor performance or even no performance if this causes something to trip offline. And the thing that's also kind of goes with this that we'll be looking at the next lecture is, is harmonics. And so harmonics are non 60 Hertz components, which are added to our waveform. And so if I had a current that was sinusoidal, if I had like a third harmonic, it would start to look something like this. Okay. And what this can do is it can cause all sorts of effects. Um, basically, this can cause equipment to overheat. It can cause transformers to overheat, motors to overheat, and it can degrade the, the functionality of our, of our loads. And so we'll get into that in part two lecture. But what we're going to focus on now is we're going to focus on more of the surges and sags. And we'll, we'll talk about these surges and sags that are due to faults first. And then in the next lecture, we'll, we'll talk about the impact of motor startup. Most of, of this is analyzed at the distribution level. So just like reliability, when we do the safety and safety, most of these events could be tied to something going on at the distribution level. Um, let's talk about spikes and sags, 50% of those are the distribution level, 75% or more interruptions are due to distribution failures, 85% of our voltage problems originate on distribution, and most of our harmonics relate to what goes on in distribution circuits. And so this is kind of why mostly this is looked at at the distribution level. And, and if you got into like large industrial customers, you didn't, you didn't have to get into the secondary side and kind of take measurements throughout their plant. So how are we gonna quantify these um, to make these a little bit more specific? Well, we, we typically break this into instantaneous versus momentary versus temporary um, sags and swells. And note this is, kind of characterized by the voltage being outside 0 0.9 to 1.1 per unit. So we're okay if we're between 90% and 110%. We get outside that, if we get lower than the 0.9, we're in a sag mode. If we get above 1.1, we're in a swell mode. The instantaneous sags, these are events that be in the 0.5 to 30 cycle range. These are typically as associated with protection. And this is kind of in the range in which fuses operate and most of your breakers operate. When we talk about momentary events, these are in the 30 cycle to three, cycle, three second range. This may be associated with protection, but a lot of times this is also associate with the automation, you know, how fast can the automation work or how fast can, can the controls respond? Um, and, and then on the temporary side, this is where you get into the second to minute range. And this is usually beyond the time at which the faults last. And so this could be associated like more with motor starts or load starts, things along those lines. And so, when you have a, a meter, for example, it's analyzing the sags and the swells occurring, some of the more sophisticated meters can actually break these events into one of these three categories. So you could tell like whether you had a, a fast instantaneous sag versus a like a temporary sag. 
we're we're concerned about swells you know where we're concerned about the over voltages would be if we have overhead let's say overhead distribution and we have surge arresters up there and we have our insulation even this is going to be the case of cables as well as this voltage becomes too high it could actually damage insulation or destroy it it could also cause issues with our surge arresters we haven't talked about that in there but you have surge arresters that kind of clamp the over voltages so we're also concerned about swells, but, but as far as customer um, voltage, quantity, um, voltage quality, we're mostly looking at SAGs for say like the industrial customers. So just kind of talking it more specifically about what might happen here. Um, if we have a complex industrial process, these are, these are gonna be sensitive to these SAGs. And I'll, I'll go through an example of a motor drive in just a little bit, but power electronic motor drives are, might have a tendency not to be able to ride through some of these events. And they might be able to ride through a normal sag, but if you have like a deep sag, that might be an issue. Uh, and if something kind of messes up um, the power electronic controls and that device is gonna trip, um, computers could potentially reset. Now, a lot of days we have laptops with batteries in them. So it's not the case like it used to be when all computers were direct line connected and they were trip if you were gonna lose um, power. Um, but the other things that happen here is we have measurements for taking in feedback control systems. Some of these measurements have power supplies that are tied into the grid. So if the grid um, fluctuates and the measurements don't become calibrated anymore, and then these manufacturing processes have these really detailed mechatronics going on like robotic arms and things like that, um, that can be disrupted. And, and a lot of processes are not 100% hardened. And so it's, it's difficult to put a UPS on an entire plant. You can put an unrepeatable power supply on a computer or maybe one controller, but to have a UPS on a whole industrial facility is is rather costly and so we can harden certain things but to do the whole plant's rather kind of difficult as far as computer power supplies um, there are standards around that for what computer um, power supplies need to be able to withstand and that's defined but what by what's referred to as a sabema curve and some other pieces of equipment might adhere to this as well. So this was originally developed for computers, but other types of devices might adhere to this as well. And this was developed because it was realized that, you know, there's going to be some amount of power quality issues on a distribution grid to which these computers are connected. And so what they came up with this as a standard and basically what it says is as long as you're within this region right here, that this computer should still continue to operate. So what this would mean is if you had a loss of power, a loss of voltage, that all the way up to 20 milliseconds, if that power could be supplied, resupplied in 20 milliseconds, that computer should still operate. What this would mean is the computer would have to have a little bit of energy storage. Usually this is in terms of a capacitor and the power supply but a little bit of energy storage in order to ride through some of these events. Now, when you get to a, um, a, a longer period of time, then they have to be able to operate with 70% voltage up to a half a second, all right? And then this range eventually shifts up where you get to 90%. So in the long term, you just have to, it just has to operate between 90 and 110%. But then you're allowing for swells, you're allowing for sags with varying um, time constraints, right? So as long as you're within these, this region right here, then this computer and its associate computer power supply should still continue to operate. And so you'll see a lot of equipment that has similar characteristics to this, where a lot of equipment is designed to to handle like a very brief utility disruption because it's just gonna happen a lot anyways.
Now, to talk more specifically about where we run into issues with an industrial loads, a very common scenario is we have a substation that has multiple feeders. And somewhere on this second feeder is an industrial facility. And this is usually at 480 volts in the United States. This is going to have all sorts of different motor drives and heating elements and direct line connected motors. And then a lot of times in these industrial plants, you have uh, equipment that's based on more in European standards and you might have to convert like to 380 volts. But anyway, a very common thing would be maybe this bottom circuit's pretty clean, but there's an adjacent feeder that's subject to faults. And so what can happen is we have a fault here. It causes a large amount of current to flow here and then we get a, a voltage drop across this transformer, which is going to translate into a voltage drop at this industrial facility, very common. So what this is going to do is in any of these power electronics that are based on having a like a link storage capacitor, you're going to see a deviation in its voltage. Uh, motors have protection functionality where they lose voltage, they have these contactors where the voltage gets too low, the contactors drop out and you disconnect the motor. Uh, DC power supplies are gonna fluctuate their voltage, sensors are gonna be miscalibrated and, and motor speeds are gonna change. And so kind of what you would see at the plant would be if you see just even a small sag in voltage single phase, this is from a MATLAB script, that we're gonna see a sag on one phase and on the non-faulted phase, we even usually see a little bit of a swell on there. And so you, could, you can actually figure this out based on your circuit model. And if you assume a location for the fault, we can kind of figure out what the customer is going to be seeing. Now, as an example, let's take a look at a, a kind of a simple motor drive. And this motor drive has an AC to DC front end. This is a simple uh, six diode rectifier. We're charging up a link capacitor and then we're using switches here to basically form an inverter that's going to control this motor. And what you're doing is by changing the frequency of the inverter output, we're controlling, we can control motor speed. So let's suppose on this circuit, we, we just look at this in steady state. Well, in steady state, this is what the current's going to be on the AC side of that AC to DC rectifier. And you'll note that we see harmonics and we'll get into this harmonics in the second part of this series in the next lecture. Uh, the supply voltage though is pretty clean. The speed stays constant. The capacitor voltage has a little bit of ripple in there, but it's, it's constant for the most part. Now, suppose we had a severe sag line to neutral. And this is the line to neutral voltage, well, what's going to happen? Well, first of all, we still have two good phases. And so we're still going to continue to the charge, be able to charge this capacitor, but not as efficiently. And what we're going to see across the capacitor, it's, it's still going to get charged up, but not to a constant DC link value. In fact, it's going to really have a lot of noise associated with it. So anyway, you can kind of see the average voltage drops. Then what happens is when the voltage across the motor becomes imbalanced, then we're going to see motor transits. All right, we're going to, there's going to be torque transits. And this is whenever you have a motor and you unbalance the voltages and, and these voltages have a lot of variability to it, um, then basically you're going to get these torque transits, which means it's kind of like the electrical torque is going to have a kind of a fluctuating characteristic, which is going to kind of twist the shaft a little bit. Because the average torque is dropping off, if the motor um, mechanical torque is greater than the electrical torque, then the speed's going to drop. We're going to basically be converting kinetic energy from the rotating mass of the machine into mechanical output. And then what's going to happen is the speed's going to fluctuate. And so if, if you had a process line, which is depending on a constant speed, like you're stretching out some material, then this is going to cause 
some issues with your process because you're not maintaining a constant speed anymore. So the speed drops off during the fault. And so anyway, these are the sort of things you, you got to be looking at if you're looking at power quality industrial facilities um, is what's going to be the impact of these sags. And then if, if it's an issue where these sags are causing a lot of problems, well, you're going to have to work with the customer and finding a way of dealing with this, and, you know, reducing the incidence of these types of events. So anyway, let's stop here for this first segment, and then we're going to walk through in the next video segment and talk about how we can put some numbers on this and, and actually kind of quantify the amount of SAG we're going to get.